where we're starting a new series today, a stewardship series uh, today, and um, let's get right down to business, and I want to talk to you today from this subject matter, God owns it all. Come on, say that, God owns it all. And I see you're so enthusiastic about that, so enthused, I appreciate it. God owns it all. Try it again. God owns it all. There we go. Now, listen to this. Let me add the next phrase to it. Therefore, you've got to release control. All right. Come on. God owns it all. <laughs> Therefore, I've got to release the control. Um, it was sometime, you know, after the service, typically we um, greet, um, you know, greet you guys. And I was greeting mother one of the services, after one of the services, and she had this child. Um, and the child had a cup in her hand. And apparently the child thought that I was going to drink from the cup, going to grab the cup. And the child immediately proceeded to say, mine, mine. And I'm thinking, I didn't touch the cup. I promise I didn't. And so she said, mine, mine. But isn't it interesting that at a very young age, we assume ownership. We assume ownership. When, when we understand this, understand that principle number one of biblical stewardship, this is, this is it. God owns it all. God owns everything. God's ownership is the guiding principle that all others hinge on. Without a proper understanding of this truth, one would err greatly in their understanding, communication, and handling of material possessions. So to acknowledge God's ownership is to acknowledge his sovereignty. Th that means, God, you are in supreme, that you are supreme, supremely in control. The Bible is replete with examples of God's ownership. Can we walk through the word just a little bit today? It's okay to read the scripture in church? All right, thank you. Leviticus. That's in your Bible. I know you said, Le, le who? Le Cray. No, Leviticus. All right. Leviticus chapter number 25 and verse number 23. Leviticus 25 and 23. I'm just going to walk through the word and we're going somewhere with this to show you that God owns it all. Leviticus 25 and 23 says this. The land shall not be sold permanently for the land is mine for you are strangers and sojourners with me. That's God speaking. Again, the land shall not be sold permanently for the land is who? God says the land is mine. Let's go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse number 11. 1 Chronicles 29 and 11. 1 Chronicles 29, 11 says this. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. So he's saying here in First Chronicles, Chronicles that all that is in heaven, and earth is his. Still in 1 Chronicles, look down at verse number 14. 1 Chronicles 29 and 14. It says, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. Now we should sing that as the offertory in our church. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee then. Amen. I see you came from that church too. 
Psalm 24 and verse number 1. Psalm 24 and 1. Psalm 24, 1, we're familiar with this. It says, the earth is the Lord's. <laughs> the earth is the Lord's. And just in case those of you, some of you try to get too smart and find loopholes, he says, and all its fullness and the world and those who dwell therein. Let me paraphrase it. The earth is the Lord's and everything else. Everything else in it belongs to God. All right? Look at Psalm 50 and verse number 10. Psalm 50 and verse number 10. Psalm 50 and 10 says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. He says, every, even the animals belong to me. So Fido, your little dog, your little cat, it belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. Look at Haggai. It's okay to read the Bible, right? V chapter 2 and verse number 8. Haggai chapter 2 and verse number 8. Haggai, that's in your Bible too, all right? Chapter 2 and verse 8. And you can check, read, jot these down and then read them in your time so that you can review them again. Haggai 2 and verse 8 says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. So now, I'm wearing a gold band today. You know what, God? This gold band right here, some of you, you got gold? Raise your hand if you got some gold on you. It belongs to God. It's God's. God says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. So notice, Everything that we see so far shows us that God owns it all. He owns the earth, everything in the earth, it belongs to him. Now, what I want to spend our remaining time with is this. I want to show you not, not only does the earth belong to the Lord and the things in the earth belong to the Lord, but you belong to God. You belong to God. First of all, if you're taking notes, notice this. Write this down. You're, I'm his, or he owns me by creation. I'm owned because I'm his creation. Genesis chapter number 1 and verse, let's start at Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. I believe that's a scripture easy to find in the Bible. Genesis 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning, what? God did what? Created the heavens and the earth. Skip down to verse number 26, Genesis 1 and 26. Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, uh, over of all the earth, and over every creep, I'm sorry, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. All right, let me go on. So now, what he's saying is this, every person that came on the planet belongs to God. Nobody got in here other than through God, because God created Adam. So we're his by creation. Now hear this, everybody, no matter who they are, Christian, non-Christian, Everybody belongs to God because he created them. Even the atheist, the agnostic, the doubter, the hater, the mean people, the pretty people, the ugly people belong to God because they're his by creation. Oh, but get ready. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number 20. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number 20. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 20, it says this. 
For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So that tells me that we are owned with his by redemption. Do you see that? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. When he says bought here, it means that God went to the marketplace. And he began to look at you and he deemed you worthy of being purchased. When he says you were bought with the price, with the price there means that which is paid for an article and which in the view of the purchaser and the seller is fair compensation or valuable consideration why it should be exchanged. Let me, let me, let me, let me unpack that. God looked at you and I. We were on the slave block of sin. We were in the kingdom of darkness. We were separated. Ephesians says we were without hope, having no God in this world. So what God did, he said, I looked at them and I deemed them valuable enough to go and buy them back out of the kingdom of darkness and bring them over into the kingdom of my dear son. Wait a minute. There was the issue. You didn't come cheap. You didn't come cheap because the wages, the payment for sin is death. And you and I had committed this tremendous thing called sin. And sin had blocked us from getting to God. So in order for God to get you, he had to go and redeem you. Wait a minute. You weren't righteous enough to redeem yourself. You couldn't pay your own price. What happened was this. God saw you. And the scripture says... What we could not do, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to redeem those who were in the flesh. What is he saying? He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What are you saying? We had no hope. We had no way of getting back to God and God The Lord Jesus Christ said, I come in the volume of the book to do your will. A body you have prepared me. He stepped out of eternity into time, took on flesh, and he to redeem those in the flesh. In other words, he lived a life that you could not live. And he died a death that you could not die. And he raised on the third day so that you would be justified and have right standing with God. Baby, you've been redeemed. No wonder the scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord. Oh, shout to me on this first Sunday of the year. Come on, say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he's redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Please understand. Don't let anybody talk down on you. God already has seen your value and said they're worth it. He already has determined your worth. And he said, you're worth me buying back. So wait a minute. If I'm his... That means I'm off limits to the devil. Totally. Can't touch this. Come on. Come on. Come on. He can't touch this. I'm off limits. Off limits because I've been redeemed. And I've not just been bought with anything. But the blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus was, listen to me, it wasn't just spilled. That blood was gathered 
and taken to the Holy of Holies and offered for your sins and my sins. Listen to me. When you look in the book of Hebrews, it talks about, it talks about that blood. It, it likened it. It says, now, if the blood of goats, bulls, all those things would just cover the sin. Then it says, how much more does the blood of Jesus wash, cleanse? You for your eternal redemption. My friend, listen to me. You have been redeemed. Come on, say I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. If you've put your faith and trust right. in Jesus Christ. If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Everybody, listen to me, is God's by creation. But everybody is not his by redemption. Because to be his by redemption, meaning at some point, you surrendered your life to Jesus. You gave your life to him. You belong to him. So I'm his by creation. I'm his by redemption. Come on, say it. I'm his by And I'm his by Here's the, look at this, back up. You're still in 1 Corinthians. Look at verse, no, 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 I can't, I can't. Oh, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. We'll, we'll, we'll go this. Back up one verse, one verse, one verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 19. It says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own. You don't even belong to you. You are not your own. L listen to it again. Or do you not know that your body, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. Temple means the dwelling place. So your body is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. This is the picture. In the Old Testament, you would see what the, the temple of the Lord, and generally you would see the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. They had the veil there separating that room, and the Shekinah glory of God filled that very temple. It was so powerful that the priest could only enter in once a year. And they would go into that Holy of Holies to uh, make atonement for the sins of the people. Because the presence of the Lord was so awesome, they used to tie a rope around the priest. Because they didn't know he'd go up in there and die. There have been people that touched the ark and died. Around his garment, they would have something called bells and pomegranates. They would tie them at the bottom. In other words, the gifts would hit the fruit. And so they would have that at the bottom. And then when they knew, the priests knew that forgiveness was extended to the nation, he began to dance. And once he began to dance, one bell would hit another pomegranate. And, and that, that they would be listening outside. And they would hear the sound of forgiveness. Wait a minute. And then the priest would slip out. Fast forward, Jesus on the cross. The scripture says that the veil was rent from top to bottom. And you have to understand, we're not talking about a little curtain like this. We're talking about a major curtain, several feet wide, thick, and it says that that thing was ripped from top to bottom, indicating that the access to God is now given. Listen, listen, listen. So now, as you enter in, what happens is this. God is not asking you to enter in. He's entering in you. <laughs> so, listen, listen. When you are born again, 
what happens is he says, I'm not going to leave this thing up to you. I'm going to come and live in them. Oh, wait a minute. Where did we hear that from? That's a fulfillment of a prophetic Old Testament scripture where he says, I will live in them. I will walk in them. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. In other words, I'm going to take up my residence on the inside of you. Because even John picked up on it, he says, greater is he that is in me. Do this, in me. Come on, do it again, in me. Paul talking to the church at Colossae says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So now the Holy Spirit lives, come, come on, say he's in me. Now. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Let me show you, let me show you the scripture. Look at Ephesians chapter number one. Ephesians chapter number one and verse number 13. Ephesians one and 13 says this. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Let me, that's, like I said, that's a sermon by itself right there. But what God did was this. He said, I'm not just going to give you a promise about your inheritance. I'm going to give you a seal guaranteeing your inheritance. How many have ever seen a title? An automobile title. I'm not talking about, you know, at the end of a name. A, 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 a title, you, you've seen an automobile? You, you've seen that? You've seen that? How many get ready to get there? How many have, have it already? You already have a title. Praise God. How many get ready to get your title? I didn't say get your title back. <laughs> Some of us may have to get our titles back. <laughs> but hear this. The title is proof that you own the car. Right? The title is proof. And what he's saying here is the Holy Spirit is the proof that God owns you. Oh, you, you, oh some of y'all missed it. The Holy Ghost is proof that you are God's property. Listen to me. That seal is on you no matter where you go. That seal is on you no matter who you're with. That seal is on you no matter what you do. That seal is on you no matter how you feel. Because God did not leave it up to you because he knew some days you would feel like a nut and some days you wouldn't. Sometimes, you hear what I'm saying? So he says, what I wanted to do, I wanted to give them something that they had nothing to do with. I'm going to come and put my spirit on them. And let me tell you something, baby, when the Holy Ghost comes. Oh, my. He's there to lead and to guide you. Jesus said it like this. I'm sending you a comforter. The word comforter is a, a, a compound word, para, and then kletos. Para means to come alongside. Kletos meaning you're called. So it's called to come alongside, to aid you, to comfort you, to lead you, to guide you, to strengthen you, to do whatever needs to be done from God's perspective in your life. At all points, you have access to the greater one. The same, oh God, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead 
Romans says it's quickening, it's making alive your mortal body. So let me tell you something. Oh, I'm hollering. Stop hollering. Stop hollering. Stop hollering. But I'm telling you that he's on the inside of you by residence. Back in the day when carpet was really, really popular, they used to say, you're a wall-to-wall, get wall-to-wall carpet. You are wall-to-wall Holy Ghost. Oh, man, come on, tap yourself, say, he's in there. At any point, you have access to, come on, say, he's in there. That's why we've got to learn to walk with him. We've got to learn to move with him. We've got to learn to be sensitive to him, how he moves, how he walks, what he does, what he wants. And you'll begin to see, not only are you his by creation, by redemption, but you're his by residence. Learn, 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 learn. Oh, I remember a preacher saying this, get to know the Holy Ghost. Get to know the Holy Ghost. Get to, he's not just a Sunday feeling. He's not just a hook of Messiah. Well, we're trying to speak in tongues, so I'm kind of making fun of that. But where we, he's there to lead you, to guide you. Listen, he's smarter than you. He knows everything. He knows math. He has a whole book called Numbers. <laughs> now, <laughs> so when you realize that, that you belong to God, it begins to elevate the value, your own value in your own sight. Wait a minute. I belong to God. If God thought enough to redeem me, I'm not going to let this little criticism come after me and chase me down and put me in the dump. I'm not going to let this bad situation define me because I'm sealed with the precious Holy Spirit and he guarantees my inheritance to come. Listen to this. came across this some time ago, and it really blessed me. A wealthy English family once invited friends to spend some time at their beautiful estate. The happy gathering was almost plunged into a terrible tragedy on the first day. When the children were swimming, one of them got into deep water and was drowning. Fortunately, the gardener heard the other screaming and plunged into the pool to rescue the helpless victims. That youngster was Winston Churchill. His parents, deeply grateful to the gardener, asked what they could do to reward him. He hesitated, and then he said, I wish my son could go to college someday and become a doctor. We'll pay his way, replied Churchill's parents. Years later, when Sir Winston was Prime Minister of England, he was stricken with pneumonia. Greatly concerned, the king summoned the best physicians who could be found to be beside the bed of the ailing leader. That doctor was Sir Alexander Fleming, the developer of penicillin. He was also the son of that gardener who had saved Winston from, the, from drowning as a boy. Later, Churchill said, rarely has one man owed his life twice to the same person. You owe your life twice to the same person, to God. Why? He created you. Put your hands out in front of you like this. Those fingers, just look at them. You have something called fingerprints. You can put them down. They're unique. Nobody else has your fingerprints. There's something, even twins don't have the same fingerprints. There's something so special about you that God says I, they need to be on the planet. And he put you here on the planet so he's your creator. Because the enemy ran interference 
and got you off God, got all of humanity off course. He said, I got to get them back. And he came and redeemed our lives from destruction. So you're his by redemption. Jesus paid the price for you. But he says, I'm not going to leave it right there. I want them to be so close to me. And I want to be so close to them. I'm going to live in them. And you're his by residence. So my friend, the least you can do is acknowledge his ownership and yield him the control. So, now, I'm, I, I want to lead you in, in uh, um, I, I, I'm getting ready to, you, you, you're getting ready to give up a job, okay? You're ready to give up a job. I know you've been running the universe. I know you're in control, and I know that, you know, when we look at everything, it, not, nothing really happens without you. But today, you've got to relinquish control. Hear this, hear this, control of my children, control of my money, control of my ministry, control of my career, control of my marriage, control of my relationships, control. When we look at it, we have to get to a place where we say, God, I'm going to give this thing to you. I'm putting it in your hands because the truth of the matter is it's best in his hands. You are best in his hands. Are you understanding that? Because he's the owner. We've got to stop trying to help him. <laughs> this is the picture that I saw. You remember the driver's ed cars? The driver's education cars generally have, you know, you got the steering column and everything in the driver's seat. But there's another steering column and brake and accelerator over here in the passenger seat. That's us. Sometimes we say, God, I, you know, I know, I know, you know, you're over there, but I'm a co-pilot this thing. God never asked you to be a co-pilot. Some of us have been so bold to say, God, I got it. I got this now. And so just, just don't worry about it. I got it. You stay there. And we're going to run our own lives. I'm going to do this. James said it like this. He said, I'm, I'm going to go here and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this rather than saying, what is the will of the Lord? God, what do you want me to do? So today I want to lead you in a relinquishing of the controls. You can't make that man what you want him to be. You can't make that woman what you want her to be. You, you've been unsuccessful so far. Can't make the children what you want them to be. Amen? All right, you ready? Stand with me, please. Hallelujah. All right. Raise your right hand, please. <laughs> you ready to do it? You ready? Okay. I, repeat after State your name. Don't you say state your name. Don't say it. Come on. <laughs> Call your name. I, Billy Johnson, give up the control of my life. I give it back to God. Today, I recognize God, you are the owner. You own everything, including me. So today, so today, I ask you, I ask you take, the wheel take the wheel of my life, of my life. Take, ownership take ownership of my life. Of my life. Help, me Help me to become all that you have intended, all that you have intended. 
and I yield myself. Spirit, soul, body, economics, relationships, everything into your hands. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now give him praise for his great control. Come and experience transforming worship at New Covenant Christian Ministries. We have two locations. Our West Campus is located at 1760 Phillips Road, Lithonia, Georgia. Our East Campus is located at 14147 Highway 278, Covington, Georgia. For more information, please visit our website at www.newcov.org.